and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Mulcahy and I'm a health educator for community health at Atlantic Health System. Today's webinar, Breast Cancer, Are You at Risk? is presented by Lynn Tamburino, who is a nurse practitioner. Um, before we begin, I have a few announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared in its entirety on our website. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button um, and use the chat feature for any qu comments. We will try to get through all questions at the end of the presentation. And Atlantic Health System would like to remind you to take care of your health. Be sure to go for your annual screenings and doctor appointments. For more information, visit AtlanticHealth.org slash your health. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Lynn. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is going to be, um, hold on, this will stop sharing. I'm going to continue, yes. Let's see if we can get that up there. There we go. So, um, yeah, this is uh, an unusual because normally I'm presenting in front of people who can actually react and talk to me. So it's going to be a little strange for me, um, but we'll, um, we'll roll with it. Um, so um, just so you know who I am, I'm a nurse practitioner that works with Atlantic Breast Associates. Um, I've been with them for about five years, but I've been at Atlantic Health for 35 years. Uh, I predominantly see women who are at elevated risk for developing breast cancer in the future, and we're going to go over a lot of what that means. So I'll start off with um, all the um, grim facts here. So um, breast cancer is actually the number one diagnosed breast cancer among women. Um, it is the second leading cause of death. So at this point, I would have asked you, what do you think is the number one cancer killer? Um, and that actually is lung cancer. And that's for both men and women. So one in eight women in the US will develop breast cancer. Actually, in the tri-state area, it's more like one in seven. In 2001, it's estimated that there'll be 330,000 new cases of breast cancer in women, and men do get breast cancer, so um, there's an estimated 2,650 cases for them. Um, and then, unfortunately, um, 43,600 women in the United States are expected to die from breast cancer. But interestingly, actually, these rates um, are holding steady in women who are under 50, um, for some time now, um, and women who are over 50, um, the, risk, the rates have actually gone down. Um, a lot of that is we've seen a lot of treatment advances. Um, we've also gotten away from using hormone replacement therapy, um, and we've come a long way with um, early detection. So those mammograms are very important. Um, so some other interesting factors here is that, um, so Caucasian women are most likely to develop breast cancer. African-American women um, are diagnosed at a younger age and they tend to have uh, more aggressive uh, type of cancers and they are more likely to and that are more aggressive and um, they're more likely to die from their breast cancers. But interestingly, the Asian, Hispanic and Native American women population is actually at lower risk. The Ashkenazi Jewish population, they do have a, um, a higher risk of breast cancer, and that's a, related to that famous BRCA mutation that everybody hears about. Um, but really only about five to 10% of um, breast cancers can be linked to a genetic mutation that's been inherited from your mom or dad. Um, and then less than 15% of women who get breast cancers have a family member diagnosed with it. So just as, as an aside, I, I separated out those two things at the bottom because um, these are actually the things that are very important. So your risk doubles when you have a first degree relative, a mother, a sister, or a daughter that's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And what that means really is if your risk was like 10% um, for your lifetime to age 85, your risk would be about 15%. So just that's the easy math. <laughs> and then 95% um, of breast cancers are curable with early detection. That means that we can, if we find it and you get your mammogram um, yearly, like you should, um, these breast cancers are usually curable. So there are two really things, sets of risk factors. There's one risk factors that you cannot change and there are risk factors that you can change. So the things that you cannot change are things like gender and um, women um, or being a female actually is the number one risk factor for um, getting breast cancer. Um, the older age um, does uh, contribute also to breast cancer. We just talked about race. 
Uh, women who have an early first period and a late menopause, so a period of like nine years old or um, or close to 60 for your menopause. And why that is, is that you, you have 80, about 85% of those breast cancers are hormone fed or driven. So when you have a prolonged uninterrupted exposure to those hormones, your risk goes up. Um, so um, that is something that can definitely contribute because you have a different sets of hormones throughout, um, throughout your, um, your lifetime. Uh, dense breast tissue um, is also a risk factor. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute. Um, history of an abnormal breast biopsy. So well, there's lots of women. Breast biopsies are very, very common. Um, things like cysts um, are all benign, but there are other types of, um, of things that you can find within the breast tissue that are not a cancer, but they are some like atypical cells, and that can actually put you at risk. Um, if you have had breast cancer previously, you are at risk to develop a higher risk than the regular population to develop breast cancer as well. Um, if you have a family history, which we talked a little bit about, about the breast cancer, but ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, or melanoma, sometimes these cancers can actually be tied together. There are certain genetic mutations um, that actually can be linked to breast cancer. This is not very common, this radiation to the chest wall, but they do do some um, radiation to the center of the chest um, for people who have um, certain types of cancers like uh, lymphomas. Um, and the, when you get that at a young age, your breast tissue is still developing. So the risk of you developing a breast cancer there is um, higher. So those patients do need additional screening as well. So these are things that you can change. Um, physical inactivity and being overweight. Now, I know that they tell you all the time that, that exercise is good for you, which we know it is, but specifically with breast cancer, it is very important. Um, and um, we will talk a little bit more about that, but when we talk about those eight, that 85% of breast cancers that are hormone fed or driven, we as women, we store hormones in our fat. So um, with breast cancer, it's very important to have lean body mass. You're actually replacing that fat with muscle um, which reduces the amount of fat you have to potentially feed and grow a breast cancer, but we will talk about that a little bit too. Pregnancy. So pregnancy helps. Um, usually we like pregnancy before the age of 35. Um, it's all back to that um, hormones um, and constant exposure. You, you have different exposure to hormones during pregnancy than you do during your regular menstrual cycle. So when you break that uh, cycle, um, you're changing the hormones that are, um, that are actually um, affecting you and, and potentially causing breast cancer risk. Um, breastfeeding. So most of the calculations that we have out there don't give you your credit for your breastfeeding, but for every year that you breastfeed, you have about a 4% um, risk reduction rate in, um, for breastfeeding. So you do get some credit. Don't think it's enough though. Um, hormone replacement therapy. So this we will talk about again in a little bit more detail, um, but we do know that this does raise your risk. Um, and then smoking and um, alcohol we'll also talk about as well. So um, everybody, uh, when they get their mammogram, they hear about dense tissue. And I just wanna spend a little time talking about dense breast tissue and what it means um, and, and to clarify some things with you, because sometimes the, your mammogram reports you get can be very confusing. Um, by law, they have to notify you of your breast density. So when you get the, your mammogram reports, um, frequently there's this long thing at the bottom, and I'll show you an example um, that talks about breast density, but you have to know what your specific density is in order to interpret the report the right way. So I'll give you an example in a minute. But these are the diff four different categories of breast tissue. So these, this is fatty tissue. This is what we call scattered fibroglandular tissue. And that means that this white stuff here um, is a little bit of dense tissue, but there's not really a whole lot. These two are dense tissue. And when we talk about the dense tissue, 50% of your breast should be this white stuff here. Um, in order to be considered dense. And then this is extremely dense. So this is like looking through cement, <laughs> very hard to image. Um, I always like to use the analogy with my patients is that these two are like looking through a glass of water and these two are like looking through a glass of milk. Um, and because of that, women with dense breast tissue, their mammogram carries about a 10 to 20% false negative. 
meaning we could potentially miss something on your imaging. So 3D mammography accompanied by whole breast ultrasound is important for women with, with this density here. Um, a couple of interesting facts about breast tissue is you're two times more likely to develop a breast cancer with dense tissue. And also, um, like we mentioned, it's harder to see, so we may miss something. So um, normally I like to throw in a couple of little funnies in here, but it's hard to tell whether you're even appreciating it <laughs> through, the, through the internet. Um, but women are actually are amazed when they have um, breasts that are, um, let's just say, um, pointing south. Um, and they are um, can't understand why their breast tissue may be dense. Well, it really doesn't have anything to do with that. It really has to do the makeup of your breast tissue. Um, some women um, I have as patients, they're in their 90s, they have cement for breasts. They are just dense um, and um, it, it really kind of can run in the family. Um, so it really doesn't matter what they look like, the bottom line is. So here's just an example of part of a report of a mammogram that, um, that uh, was given by Marstown um, Medical Center. And um, this is the part of the report where it tells you, it'll say the breasts are heterogeneously dense. Okay, so this is like one of the dense categories. Um, and it, gives, it tells you that your mammogram is normal and follow up in a year. But then there's this entire big paragraph afterwards talking about the breast, breast density law. Um, but what you have to remind yourself of is you have to read this portion that talks about what the dense tissue is, because if you were to have a report that said it was fatty, then you have non-dense tissue or scattered fibroglandular tissue, fibro scattered fibroglandular tissue, you have non-dense tissue. So it's important to look at that because a lot of women interpret this report as saying that, that you have dense tissue, but really it's just informing you of what the breast uh, density law is. So we're going to jump back to the, um, the risk factors. And the first one I'm going to talk about is that hormone replacement therapy. So back in, I know I talked to you a little bit in the beginning and um, about the hormone replacement therapy, the fact that the um, risk has actually um, kind of gone down in women over the age of 50 because they found a link between hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer in 2002, or they really solidified it. I think they knew it before that. Um, and here's the interesting facts about hormone replacement therapy. So combination hormone replacement therapy, that's that estrogen and progesterone actually raises your risk by about 75%. Um, that's pretty high. Um, the risk is highest in your first couple of years. And if you continue on it for years after that, once you stop, the literature is somewhere between two and five years as far as to um, when your risk normalizes after you stop taking it. So if you stop taking it, your risk um, does eventually go back to average, your, whatever your risk would be before. And then um, estrogen only. There are some women who do take estrogen um, just by themselves. Really, the risk goes up when you've been taking it for about 10 years. Um, but there is also an associated risk of ovarian cancer that goes along with taking estrogen. And then I have a lot of my patients that say, and this is important, uh, that say, well, my doctor gave them to me and they said they're bioidentical and they're safer. But the fact of the matter is, is that they ca carries the same exact risk as reg regular hormone replacement therapy. So the bioidenticals do carry the risk and they do increase your risk. Um, so women who have a family history and are at risk should absolutely not be taking hormone replacement therapy. So alcohol, this is my least favorite slide. Um, so um, alcohol can increase your risk of the more common type of breast cancer. The literature goes between four and seven drinks a week gives you a 10% higher risk. And it's 10% again of your personal risk. So when I talk about all these risks, it's not an additive risk. So 10%, so if you're back to you have a lifetime risk of 10%, your risk would be 11 if you have um, seven or more drinks. And then the, the risks do go up after that. If you've had breast cancer before, um, you also are at risk for recurrent breast cancer if you drink significant amounts of alcohol. Um, cigarette smoking. Now we know cigarette smoking causes lots of cancers. Um, we know it, uh, we expect it to cause lung cancer, but it does cause several others and it does contribute to your breast cancer risk. And the risk is somewhere between 14 and 56%. And that really depends on how, how old were you when you stopped smoking, I mean, started smoking. Um, when they, we, people who smoked at younger years actually have a higher risk. 
Um, and then how long have you been smoking? And um, is there a family history of breast cancer? So if you have a family history of breast cancer and you're smoking, your risk is even higher. Um, they have seen some increased um, risk of breast cancer in women who are postmenopausal who have had significant secondhand smoke exposure from um, spouse or even um, growing up in a household. Um, they haven't really, the literature is still out on that, so they don't give you any kind of percentages or anything like that. Important things to note, though, is even not only for breast surgery, but for other surgeries, um, people who smoke, um, the nicotine actually um, decreases the or shrinks your little blood vessels there and makes it very hard for you to, um, to heal. Um, so in the breast world, in women who have breast cancer and they're um, getting mastectomy, um, it does actually limit your reconstruction options because the, um, we can't do certain types of reconstruction on people who are actively smoking. Um, cigarette smoking and hormones and, um, and other things can lead to um, some blood clots as well. So especially um, you should not be cigarette smoking and on hormone replacement therapy or birth control pill for that matter. Um, and then uh, obesity, we did talk a little bit about this. Um, it increases your risk for um, recurrence if you've had a breast cancer before. And I did, um, when we're postmenopausal, we're not really making, uh, producing estrogen from our ovaries anymore, but we do make estrogen in other, from other places like your liver, your bones, your adrenal glands. And um, that estrogen is stored in our fat. Um, so the more fat cells you have, the more estrogen you have. Um, the more you can potentially grow that hormone positive breast cancer, which is the one that's most common that 85% of women get. Interestingly, if you are more of a uh, apple than a pear, um, you um, are at more risk. Um, but we already talked about the fact that exercise does work and they, um, the literature does recommend that it's um, four to seven hours per week of cardiovascular exercise. Um, we do have a dietitian that's associated with the high risk breast program here, um, who has helped a lot of our patients um, lose weight. Um, and the dietitians are also available to talk about um, um, diets as it relates to, to cancer, just risk in general. So, um, you yeah, know, here's another funny, something that I thought was funny anyway. <laughs> so, um, Mammogram again is, um, is very important. And we're gonna talk about uh, screening now um, and early detection. So um, early detection is, um, is also very important. Um, again, 95% of breast cancers found on routine imaging are curable. Um, breast self-exam and breast health awareness, very important. This should begin around the age of 21. Um, women should be come start familiar with how their breasts feel and look. Um, a clinical breast exam. So this is for all the general population. All women should be having a clinical breast exam, meaning a, an exam by a medical professional. Um, usually it's your gynecologist, but there are a lot of primary care providers that will provide this as well. Um, the mammogram is the gold standard. That is the thing that's been proven to um, get those breast cancers and see them early. Um, so uh, you should uh, be having a mammogram annually after age 40 or 40 and over. Um, if you have a family history of breast cancer, you will begin screening earlier than that. It's usually 10 years prior to your youngest family member that had a breast cancer. Um, and that ultrasound addition is important for those women with the dense tissue so we can see through the tissue a little bit better. So when we talk about high-risk screening and high-risk monitoring, so these are women who have a lifetime risk of 20% or higher. So um, meaning that um, you, you still have a 80% uh, chance of uh, not getting breast cancer, but there's a 20% chance. And it doesn't mean you're going to develop breast cancer, um, but it, it is a risk. So what we uh, recommend for those women, again, we're back to that monthly self-breast examination. Um, the mammography with the ultrasound. And then for women who are a lifetime risk of 20% or higher, we um, add an, an MRI. Um, within Atlantic Health, we now have the ability to do something called an abbreviated MRI. So it's about eight to 10 minutes instead of 35 minutes, which is a much more comfortable test for women. Um, so 
the yearly breast exam, you should be seeing a breast specialist um, if you have a lifetime risk of 20% or higher. And you would also continue to follow with your gynecologist. So really the, the recommendations are that you get a breast exam every six to 12 months. So one, you would see the breast specialist once um, a year and the GYN once a year, trying to spread them out about six months apart. Um, genetic testing. So genetic testing is something that we do look at for either women who've been diagnosed for breast, with breast cancer or women with strong family histories. And it's really, it's not only the history of breast cancer, but it, like I mentioned previously, the, um, the breast, the pancreatic, prostate, ovarian, they can all tie together. So um, genetic testing is performed if, um, if people do meet criteria. Um, if they do test positive, we do have genetic counselors within Atlantic Health and they are referred to them for further counseling. Um, again, we do have the dietitian. We also have a metabolic center. So I usually refer um, patients to the dietitian who are fluffy like me, um, maybe have, know they're uh, eating and drinking too much and just need a little uh, help or guidance. Um, women who have been obese their entire life, I usually refer to the metabolic center. Um, and these are, uh, the metabolic center is a, um, has a wide range of um, providers there. They have dietitians and, um, and uh, specialists that uh, look at, at them as a whole person and um, they do do blood work and look for insulin, insulin resistance and things. If women are at particularly high risk um, and they have had an abnormal biopsy, that's one of those atypical cells that I was talking about a little bit before, um, uh, and they've been diagnosed with that, there is um, this endocrine therapy. Now, a lot of you have probably heard about tamoxifen. So tamoxifen is a medication that we give to women who have that hormone positive tumor, that, that common type of tumor. Um, we give that to them to reduce their risk of that breast cancer coming back. So it actually works the same way. It, it cuts the risk of, um, of getting a breast cancer by about 50%. Um, it's not without um, side effects. So tamoxifen, there is a very slight risk of the fact that you could get it, develop a uterine cancer. Um, these things can cause uh, joint pain and, um, and hot flashes and things like that. Um, the uh, non-tamoxifens, um, these aromatase inhibitors, they can actually increase your risk of osteoporosis. So um, these are, we really are reserved for the people who have had those atypical cells and are a really high risk um, for developing breast cancer in the future. Also women who have decided not to have preventative surgery um, that have some type of genetic mutations that can predispose them to having a, um, a estrogen positive breast cancer or hormone positive breast cancer, would, that would also be recommended at that point. Preventative surgery, we really, um, and this very long word here, that salpingo-oophorectory means your tubes and ovaries are out. So um, that's what that means. Um, and uh, so, or you can have a mastectomy. Um, we really reserve that for the people who are at really very high risk or the people who um, have that BRCA gene um, that everybody talks about. Um, so we don't um, run to this. This is life-changing operations. So um, we really don't run to that unless it's a, a risk, but for those women who are at high risk um, it is, um, can be absolutely necessary. Um, so I'm just going to um, just remind everybody of our um, Atlantic Health programs here. So the Ripple Breast Center, that is um, where you can call to schedule your mammogram. And you actually can um, self-refer for your mammogram. You don't need a prescription. Um, you can actually call and do self-referral. Um, so that is something that's recent. Um, we do have the smoking cessation program here. This is the phone number for the, the social worker who runs that program. We've been very successful at having some of our patients quit smoking. Um, and then we have the high-risk breast cancer program here at Atlantic Health. 
this is still in sort of in its infancy. It's I guess it's been about three years since we um, started the program. Um, the current locations we have are at Marstown, Overlook, Rockaway, and Chilton. We do have office location in Bridgewater. Um, we are looking at, to expand to the um, northwestern region, meaning um, we are looking at uh, possibly expanding to Byram in the near future to capture um, the ladies out of uh, Hackettstown and uh, Newton area. So um, when you come to Atlantic Health and you have your mammogram, um, you are given a, a questionnaire on a tablet and um, you complete that questionnaire and it asks a lot of questions about your breast health. Um, it then generates a risk score. Um, if your risk score is 20% or higher, you are then referred to the high risk program. Um, this is the phone number for their high risk program. You don't have to go through there if you have um, a, a large family history or you have some questions about your breast health. Um, you are more than welcome to make appointment. Um, currently, um, the, it's, there's two nurse practitioners. It's myself and Suzette Davenport. Um, and so um, we, you can be seen at any one of our locations. So um, I think that's when I will ask Jessica to um, bring up any questions. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I had, I had had a question, but you already kind of answered it because I was wondering how you calculated the 20% um, cumulative risk for someone to determine they were high risk. Um, and if someone I know you said that if they come for their mammogram and they can take this test, with the, is there an opportunity for people to do that before their mammogram? If do any of the OBGY or GYNs in the area do that? Um, if someone so indicates that they have a family history? Yeah, so there's multiple different scores. There's the, the most common score is something called a tire cusick score, and it's really a score that um, takes into consideration multiple factors, um, family history, um, you know, your height, your weight, your um, all those things that I talked about in the beginning, as far as the your um, your menopause age, the first age when you had your first period, the age when when you had your first baby. So it's a calculation that's done. Yes, there are some GYNs who, who do do the calculations um, and that some of them do follow them for high risk. Uh, most of them refer them out. Um, and um, so the calculation um, is based on multiple different things. I also use that tire Cusick model. So when patients actually come in with a risk score, um, some other uh, radiology centers do generate risk scores. I redo the risk score with the patient in front of them so that um, we make sure that we get all of the data correct. Because um, sometimes just little tiny things can, that can change um, can change the score. Mm -hmm. um, and breast density does play a role. Okay, excellent. Um, and we do have a question regarding the alcohol intake. Um, do you yeah. see, yeah, it's, it's a hot topic sometimes. Do both wine and liquor have the same risk impact? Ooh. Yes, so there are those equivalents that they talk about, right? The, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, glass of wine, which is what I think it's supposed to be four ounces. Who drinks a four ounce glass of wine? Not me. Um, but, um, you know, the, and the one ounce of liquor. So, yeah, those are the equivalents, just like the alcohol content kind of thing, equivalents. It mm -hmm. is the can of beer, you know, that kind of thing. So, yes, it's all the same. Okay. Yeah, very good. Um, and for those of you who may be joined after we got started again, um, you are muted. So we are taking questions through the Q&A or the chat. Um, so you can type those questions in. And um, yeah, I know it takes a little longer, so we'll give a, everyone a moment. So, but very, a very interesting presentation. And I know just from a personal standpoint, it's always interesting for me because I do have a family history. So I like to learn everything that I can about what's new and what's happening and best prevention practices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very common cancer, but it's very curable. And that's mm -hmm. like really the most important thing for people to remember, so. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions about the programs, again, um, we will send out a copy of these slides with those resources and numbers for you. 
Um, and if you have any questions, I could also send out information about our, our quit smoking programs because it is a very successful program. Um, I know that they do an intake um, and then you, we have six week classes and um, free NRT or nicotine replacement therapy to help you um, be successful in your quit attempt. And I do see um, we have another question in the Q&A. Um, can you explain bioidenticals? Um, <laughs> sort of, I don't prescribe them. So, um, but it is, there are medications that, and I don't know how it works. And there's a particular physicians that do go ahead and, and do the, the, the bioidenticals, but they try to match you and, um, the hormones specifically through blood work. Um, but I don't know exactly how it works. So I apologize for that, but, um, I don't know exactly how it works, but it does carry the same risk. Um, and it is supposed to be more tailored to the individual patient, the hormones, um, based on your, um, your blood levels. Um, but I don't know exactly, um, since I'm not um, somebody who actually routinely um, prescribes them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, definitely an interesting topic, maybe something that we could consider for the future. Um, and it also, um, that leads me into if anyone has any topics that they'd like to see in the future, especially around breast health in general. Um, we're always happy to hear your feedback so that we can develop new programs tailored towards um, you. And so at the end of this program, we do have a survey that you'll be able to take and you can um, let us know what other topics you'd like to see um, presented. And we have another question. Um, if you've been on birth con the birth control pill since you were very young, are you at a higher risk? Very, very good question. Um, and the answer is no. Um, they've done so many studies um, re researching, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of women who have been on birth control pill, um, and they have not um, seen a link between that and breast cancer. I say that, but then when um, we do, some of the literature has shown that if you've been on a birth control pill for 30, 35 years, you may have a one or 2% increase in risk. Um, it, but if you do develop some um, and have a biopsy and you have a breast cancer or you have um, some atypical cells on a biopsy, um, it is recommended that you do come off the birth control pill because it is a hormone, mm -hmm. but it doesn't carry the risk that hormone replacement therapy does. Interesting. And is there any data on the different? I know there's a lot of different types of birth control. Um, is Not there really. Any difference? No. Okay. There's no difference. They're all kind of low dose hormones, um, and um, so and they actually are ovary protective. So, um, so it has its benefits. So, even for women who um, are BRCA positive that um, are um, waiting to have their uh, their preventative surgery. Um, they are on birth control pills, um, basically to uh, control the risk of ovarian cancer um, while they're waiting. So, um, and they do have obviously a risk for breast cancer, but uh, the risk of the ovarian cancer and everything, um, they, they do put them on birth control. Great. Excellent questions. All right. And I'll give it one more minute for any additional questions. Oh, and thank you to those of you who have joined us today. Mm -hmm. nice. okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I think well, with that, we can conclude the webinar. Um, thank you for joining us and a special thank you to Lynn for dedicating your time and expertise today. Um, if you guys have any additional questions or comments after the program, you can send an email to communityhealth at atlantichealth.org or you can call us at 1-844-472-8499. Thank you and have a great day. Uh -huh.